Hey everybody, Dr. Pedram Shojai of The Health Bridge here with Dr. Sarah Gottfried. Hello everyone. Hey, hey, so Sarah and I have been working hard on this thing called a gong and uh, we're gonna give you a little update on our own progress being, uh, you know, busy, uh, swirling people in the universe of health and wellness and uh, catch up on just a, a few things. We get a lot of questions and comments, so this is going to be kind of a, a more relaxed, uh, just answering some, some questions and giving you guys updates on how things are going type of show. How's that sound? I think that sounds awesome. It's like you and I are sitting on the couch drinking some tea since we're not drinking alcohol in the gong and, we're, and I'm not drinking coffee. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. We're hanging out and talking about what's been up. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm on day 10, you're on day nine. Um, yeah, because I screwed up. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I had to start over. That happens. I almost screwed up the other night. I mean, I was two nights ago, I was walking down the, the block, listening to a book on tape to fulfill my 5,000 steps. Uh, I still had like 1,200 steps to do, and pacing up and down the hallway uh, wasn't working, so I just took the show on the road because I was falling asleep, so I listened to a book on tape and got my steps in, came in and was done, but it was a close call because Daddy just wanted to sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to say, there's been many nights where it's about nine o'clock, and I realize I haven't gotten all my push-ups in, or I haven't swung the kettlebell enough, or I haven't meditated my full amount. And so, yeah, sometimes it's a little bit later, but I can tell you, when you do it, it feels so good. It feels so congruent. You know, even if it's a little later at night, due to my poor planning. I mean, frankly, it's no one's fault but my own that it's nine o'clock at night and I'm doing push-ups. Yeah, that's it. And so that always stings me. It's just like, okay, so you left your self-care for the end of the day when there's nothing left for you. Suffer, dude. Right? And and so, you know, what do you do? I mean, we just had a great show with Ben Greenfield. It's like you, you hack your environment. So I'm at a standing desk. It's really easy for me to drop and give 10 push-ups, no problem. Right? But I have to remember to do so. So it's like, oh, wow, I have this super... Uh, efficient computing device in front of me that I do all my work on and it can just as easily send me a quick reminder every half hour and say drop and give me 10 and so how is it that I didn't hack that into my schedule so it really makes you align and think about how you run your day and why we you know decide to like just kill ourselves all day and then stumble across the finish line by doing something uh, in, in the realm of self-care just almost as a band-aid at the end of the day versus taking care of yourself throughout yeah, it's such a good point. It's such a good point. And I, that's what I love about doing this gong. I'm so glad you got me excited about this and that we shared it with our community. I have to tell you a quick story. I was at a dinner party on Sunday night. I was hanging out with a, a girlfriend of mine who I went to residency with. She's a gynecologic oncologist. She like takes out ovarian cancer as her job. And another couple. And somehow it came up that I was doing my gong and uh, so I explained what a gong was and what I was doing. And all of these people were just like staring at me with their mouths hanging open. <laughs> just like, you're doing a what? <laughs> so it's funny, you get kind of accustomed to this idea of a gong. And then you realize that most of the world has no idea what you're talking about. And it's, it's great to translate it. And then they were totally on board. They're like, I want to do a gong. Can I still start it? And I was like, yeah, go to healthbridgeshow.com forward slash gong. You can see what we're doing. You can see how to build a gong. You can learn how to do this. Yeah, it's fun. And you know, what's funny is I've had a few friends get jealous. They're like, hey, wait a minute. How come you didn't ask me to join? And so we had uh, Abel James uh, basically stayed with me for the last two weeks at the house. So Abel and his fiance Allison are now on a gong. Summer Bach, Alan Christensen. So it's like all these people that were around right when we were starting were like, hey, I, I want to play. And so now they're doing their own gongs because it's not about you know, it's, 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 gongs aren't a Pedram thing. They're not a Sarah thing. They're a personal thing. So the question is, what can you do for yourself every single day to move the needle, to make yourself better, to make you feel better about where you're at in life? And why isn't that built into your hectic schedule? Why isn't the self-care um, ingrained into how you live so that you're not sitting there licking your wounds at the end of the day? And, and so it's, it becomes a really powerful personal practice. It is, and I, I really appreciate these questions that you're asking, Pedram, because they're empowering questions. It reminds me of the show that we did recently with Sean Stevenson, 
where he talked about the disempowering questions, you know, where I'm saying to myself, day three of the gong, why did I wait until nine o'clock to do my push-ups and swing my kettlebell? Blah, you know, why won't anyone help me? Why don't I have an easier day? Those are disempowering questions. The empowering question is, okay, how do you fit in these practices throughout your day? How do you hack your environment so that you are evenly spacing out this experience that you're having in the gong and not waiting until the last minute. So uh, thank you for asking those empowering questions. Thank you for uh, answering them. You know, it's funny, we were driving up to a mountain retreat center this last weekend, and so Abel James and Allison were driving their own rig, and I had Dr. Michael Yang, who's a mutual friend of ours, and my wife, Elmira, the two dogs, and our baby soul in my car, and we're driving up, and I say, guys, I got some gonging to do, and so part of it is either reading for 20 minutes or listening to an audio program for 20 minutes, so how about we stop the music for a second and all just learn something together? And it was one of those things where most people are like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? How am I going to, you know, I don't want to be disruptive. And, you know, here are two, you know, able-bodied adults that are like, great, let's learn something. So we listened to a half hour show and learned something about, uh, you know, the, the legal system. It was just some random show that Mike wanted us to listen to. And we all got better for that half hour. We all, you know, grew and, and did something for ourselves. So it's really fun to tag in socially with people and say how can we support each other's growth and one of the things that you know you want to swallow is oh but they're gonna they're gonna you know ridicule me or they're gonna make fun of me or they they're not gonna want to and who doesn't want to learn right and so the people around us all want to get better they don't know how so it's up to us and I'm not saying like you and you and myself Sarah because we have you know practices and businesses that have done this for years but the average person who's a tax accountant or doing whatever they're doing in life doesn't believe that they can be an inspiration to the people around them and that's a really important lesson because just by you taking care of yourself you can ignite the people all around you by example and that's one of the most powerful vehicles for change we have oh so true i mean that's the stuff that starts revolutions it's it's like that aphorism the rising tide lifts all boats you know, when you're doing a gong and you're in the car and you ask everybody to listen to, you know, to learn something for 20 minutes as you listen to a podcast or some other show, you got a rising tide there. And I, I totally agree with you that the way you can most be of service is to figure out some of these unique abilities that you have. You know, maybe some of them are put in your gong or your gong is used as a way to balance out some of your strengths and weaknesses. And then when you share it with others, that's the secret sauce. Like that's mm. where I think you you really start to um, create that social contagion, right? Of like positive health experiences for the people around you. So that's a beautiful thing. You know, I, I brought up Sean Stevenson, and I just wanted to ask you a question. Sean was talking about. Well, actually, I asked him about the death of Robin Williams because we were talking about depression. And there was a, a moment where he was, I really, I understand what he was saying. He was talking about how when you're suffering with depression and you're thinking about taking your life and you're um, in so much pain that you just can't even imagine suffering another minute more, how... I think it's hard to stay connected to the sense that your family is going to miss you so terribly and your community is going to miss you so terribly if you make that choice to take your life. And I think when Sean was talking about it as a, you know, almost a selfish act, I think there was some misunderstanding around that. So I, I just thought it might be helpful for us to talk that through a little bit more. What do you think, Pedro? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we definitely had some backlash people saying, hey, listen, you know, he doesn't understand depression and all this kind of stuff. And Taken out of context, you know, it's, yeah, that's not the right thing to say. I, I, I certainly don't believe that's how he meant it either because uh, he's, you know, a thoughtful dude who's been around the block. And, and really, I think maybe we could just take a few minutes and, and talk about this because taking your own life as a selfish act is not a, a helpful framework because what it's doing is it's really missing what someone is going through going up to that decision. I mean... Things are painful. Like, you know, I, like I mentioned in that show, I mean, I've had a couple suicides in my family and it was 
ugly, right? And it became abundantly clear to me how much pain and suffering these individuals were going through and how much they pretended to be okay, how much they fought, how much they denied, and how much they struggled to just get on with day-to-day -day life. Um, and to have come to that decision and say, it's just no longer worth it. I know my mom's gonna miss me. I know my family's gonna miss me. And all these other things that kind of triage into that decision-making process is, man, you've been through a lot of thinking and you've fought upstream and swam upstream and fought this thing for a long time usually before that decision starts to gel uh, and become a, a potential uh, in your reality. I agree with that and I I also think that um, you know I, I'm such a fan of Robin Williams I've I've talked about this before that his humor his um, his verve, I've seen him speak in person as well as, you know, all the, the movies and the TV shows going back to Mork and Mindy. We had, yes. a, we had a Robin Williams film festival last weekend. My husband was out of town and we watched Goodwill Hunting and Dead Poets Society, Mrs. Doubtfire. My kids and I were just having a great time. And I don't, you know, there's very few people who have the kind of comedic genius that Robin William, William Robin Williams has and I think there's a shadow side to it that in some ways like tremendous um, a tremendous gift for comedy can also be a mask and it can hide some of that pain and suffering that he perhaps was experiencing and I'm totally speculating here you know I don't know him I didn't know him. I don't. I don't know his diagnoses. I, I know that he struggled with. I've heard depression. I've heard manic depression. I've heard autism, Asperger's. I've heard a lot of different diagnoses, and I don't know what the truth is. But I, I believe, you know, as someone who's struggled with addiction, I think that he had tremendous pain, and one of his ways of coping with that was to really pour some of his life energy into comedy. Yeah, and you, like if we were to contrast uh, with, say, George Carlin, who was an incredibly cynical, uh, politically vocal, verbal, uh, you know, catalyst uh, as, a, as a comedian, and also really went there and talked about things that were uncomfortable, talked about things that really pissed him off, and he used comedy as a vehicle to try to instill social change. Um, I almost feel like he had a bit more of a pressure release valve for the darker sides uh, to come out through his comedy, where Robin Williams almost pigeonholed himself into being that kind of up and manic energy, kind of funny, you know, everyone loves Robin type of guy. And, and, and some of that has to do with your personal exposure, the, the storefront that you present to your audience or the world, and how some of that facade comes back to bite you. I mean, you look at the, the alternating masks of, of, you know, the symbols of drama and how none of these masks are your true self and the real essence of the practice is to understand that, that the true self is something much more uh, uh, magical. And so if you start to identify with that, but like your inner persona, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and the, the inner shadow is, is really a sad person who doesn't get to express that publicly, then it leads to a lot of trouble. And I mean, and I know George Carlin, you know, towards the end of his career was really frustrated because he'd been talking this stuff for, you know, decades and the world nece wasn't necessarily getting any better. The, the world he was complaining about wasn't necessarily getting any better. So there's a channel for that. And, I, and I'm, again, speculating as well is that there's different ways of, of skinning that. And I think Robin got pinned into that manic depressive type of external uh, persona and his inner life uh, was probably a secret to most people. Maybe, maybe. I, you know, one thing that I think is interesting, because I'm fascinated by the link between genius, especially for artists like Robin Williams, and these uh, what we call mental health illnesses. And if you, you know, I, I, I gave a talk once on Georgia O'Keeffe and some of the you know, the darker sides of her life and how they led to the greatest contributions that she made in her painting. And I feel like for many artists, it's the, um, you know, those feeling those deep lows is part of the ascent again, in terms of, you know, really creating 
something extraordinary. And so, you know, another rumor that I heard about Robin Williams, I have no idea if this is true, is that he didn't take his medications consistently, that he was prescribed for some of his uh, diagnoses that we've heard, such as manic depression. And I, I, and part of the reason for that was that he felt like it, it uh, damped down his comedic gift. And so I can really relate to that because I feel like this is also a greater failure of the mental health system and how we tend to medicate people who have depression or manic, de manic depression so that the highs are not as high, the lows are not as low, and yet we often don't save people from the low lows. But, you know, when we're going for this, this strategy of trying to even people out, and that doesn't necessarily help people either. Sometimes they turn to other things like alcohol or drugs as a way of coping with the low lows or checking out. So it's just another piece that I think is important to talk about, you know, this idea that we sometimes hold out the solution as being that you take a pill. Mm. And... Uh, that doesn't always work, especially when you have such a gift, so much talent, and medicating as a side effect, medications can sometimes uh, limit your ability to express that talent. Yeah, and it's his superpower, it, and it's sad. I mean, what would have been different if he would have come out publicly on stage, made a couple jokes, and then disclosed that he's been fighting with depression on stage uh, to millions and millions of people so that people understand that that guy isn't all there is. The entirety of that, you know, that superpower is also built on, you know, really coming from trying to catalyze the darker sides of, of our human psyche and our pain and our suffering and things that are just not cool to talk about on, on a stage because we all just want to be entertained and laugh, ha ha. But that's not reality. Reality is there's pain. Reality is that there's suffering. And reality is that we all struggle. But you know, when someone comes up and says, hey, Sarah, how you doing? The answer could be great, great, never been better. And you might have just gotten to a fight with your teenage daughter and had a really rough day, but you know, people can't know that you're human. And, and that's, I think, a big part of our kind of cultural challenges with public personalities as well, is people aren't allowed to be themselves, and that's not fair. Mm. I think that's very true. Yeah. Well, this is a deep conversation, Pedram. <laughs> <laughs> we both love Robin Williams, and so it's just it's sad. And, and this we just had a, a lot of uh, feedback from that show, so we, we definitely we honor your guys' feedback. So we're definitely uh, coming back around to honor that. And, and, and Sean's a great guy, and that's, in my opinion, that's definitely not what he meant. But we appreciate you guys coming back because it's a sensitive subject. And for someone who's had, you know, depressive people in family who have taken their lives, it's a very sensitive subject, so I get it, and it's not easy. So we honor you guys for reaching out to us on that. Definitely. You know, there's, it reminds me a little bit of the, I think it's a quote from Chekhov, and I might totally butcher this, but this idea that every perfect family is the same, but every dysfunctional family is completely different. You know, I think one's experience with depression, manic depression, autism, Asperger's, everyone's experience is different. And you know, it's not that we're trying to psychoanalyze Robin Williams and why he took his life. It's more that we want to have a real conversation about it. And we really want to hear your feedback. Like, what do you think? How are you processing your grief? What do you miss? And also, maybe we can help save a couple lives out here, guys. If you are feeling depressed, if you are feeling like, you know, you've been struggling with this uh, deep depression and considering, you know, taking your life and all these types of things that have come up, have bubbled up with this, this news of someone who we all know did this, um, it's important to reach out to the people in your world. It's important to reach, and if you don't trust the people in your world, it's, it's important to reach out to hotlines and, and resources that are out there for help because there are, there are methodologies, there are treatments, and it's not always throwing drugs at you, right? But there are solutions. There are millions of people that dedicate their lives to helping people with depression. And they can't help you if they don't know that you need their help. So you gotta come out of your shell and really seek that help because you're not you're not alone and it's 
super important to understand that there are solutions to the problem and you can't see them under the weight of what you're feeling. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. I mean, that's that's part of one of the symptoms of depression, I think, is denial and not having the clarity about the resources that you have in front of you. So I feel like that's a beautiful note to end on, Pedro. Thank you. And, you know, look, this is this is close to home. Like I like I said, I've had people in my world die, people that were close to me, and it just it, it rattled our entire family. And, you know, I think what would life be like if those guys were still here, right? How, how do they, how, how is it that they haven't met my son, right? And so, you know, I, I, I think of them often and um, it always brings back remorse for me not having known the telltale signs and all the things that, you know, I, I, I couldn't have known at the time. I guess I could have known, but I just didn't know when, when it happened. But look for the telltale signs, guys. And, and you know, if you have someone in your life that's becoming more reclusive and, and you know, um, not engaging and all that, you know, really engage in the dialogue there. It's okay. People get depressed, but hiding it and burying it and pretending you're not is a problem. And that's where some of, uh, you know, some of the, the good work can be done in every single family uh, across the world is, you guys, we are here to look out for each other. So don't expect the school or the doctor or someone in that role uh, to ultimately catch it because there's so few touch points and there's so many people running through those systems. That's what families are for. So look for it, communicate, and understand how we are here to support each other as a web of life. Beautiful. All right, and so I, would I would just add as an asterisk, go see a functional medicine <laughs> provider, please. Mm. You know, so many people I think end up with their primary care provider or with a psychiatrist, which I think is fine. Like we wanna have an integrated approach but you can also go to functionalmedicine.org. There's a list there of people who've been trained in functional medicine. And dealing with depression is like bread and butter to people who do functional medicine. So I really want to encourage people to seek the help of a professional. It's very important. Yeah, uh, well, well, well placed because it might be a nutrient deficiency. It might be a food allergy, a mold toxicity. There's so many things that can be uncovered that we know about now that might be leading to this, this condition that, that you're interpreting as depression. And yes, maybe there are depressive things there, but like the environmental load and all these things that a good qualified functional doctor can, can unearth uh, can make a tremendous difference. So yeah, well well uh, put and well brought up. So guys, uh, healthbridgeshow.com, uh, that's where you can find us. We, you know, we love doing this and we're here to serve. And um, if you want to follow um, our gongs and our own personal trials and tribulations, go to healthbridgeshow.com slash gong and join us. It's not too late. It's never too late. Get on the horse and start doing something that's good for you and be a part of the solution and, and really help ignite that light of health and enthusiasm in your family, in your community, because that's, that's why Sarah and I do this, not to hear ourselves talk. It's to help inspire people to not fall into the broken systems and, and really get better. That's right. Come gone with us. It's never too late. Awesome. Guys, uh, we'll see you next time, and uh, let us know uh, on you know wherever you're consuming this, uh, you know on the social channels, uh, you know what you think, and your opinion obviously matters to us. And here we are talking about you know feedback, so you know we we respond to you guys. So looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thanks everybody. See you next time. 